Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Scroll through the comments section, I'd like to answer some of the comments or, or questions in the comments. Here's one. Hey Andy, another thumbs up as always, I have a clarifying question. If the COVID shutdown was man-made, wouldn't we consider the extreme monetary inflation that followed as man-made too, resulting in a distortion of the charts, such as housing starts, and when that man-made wave of money dries up, that the recession that was due in 2019 finally has a chance to play out. So, yes, the amount of money created was man-made. The structural deficit in real estate is not man-made because this was building steam since 2011. In 2011, we started to recover. Uh, 2009 was kind of the blowout year. 2010, we were recovering a little bit. And inventory has been, been basically soaked up the entire time. Foreclosures ran out in 2016, 2017. Uh, and that's when we saw our first kind of housing real estate market kind of start to move higher. Now we have this 5 million home deficit, which is going to push real estate much higher than where it is today. It's going to keep going up until we slow it down with inventory. Problem is we don't have inventory. The housing starts as the thing in an expansionary phase that can slow home prices. And that, that real estate market is going to remain hot until we build. We've been building around 1.6 million homes between one and a half and 1.6 million, which is just barely above the average. If we can't build more homes because of whatever reasons, whether it be supply shortages or labor shortages or whatever it is, the home prices are going to continue to go higher. We're having more and more people come in, you know, bidding over the same homes. Too many buyers, not enough sellers. Therefore, it's got to become less affordable. That's how you price people out of the market. And that is, that is what happens is home prices are going to become a lot less affordable in market conditions that we have today. So these guys that say, well, home prices, they're, they're being a lot less affordable. They have to be. That's how you price everyone out. That is the definition of of a supply demand imbalance you you prices go up you have to price people out and then you're going to have to turn on to make more homes because that's where the inventory comes you can't you can't foreclose your way out of this if if you have too many people and not enough homes you have to build more homes that is the solution if you can't build the homes because either the homes are too expensive to build or you don't have the labor to do it, well, home prices are going to get more expensive. You've got to price more people out. And you have to continually price more people out. Or until we build the homes. And if, if, if home prices are too costly to build, then the price of homes have to continue to go up until that equals each other out. And if that is a true thing, then you'll see rent prices go up. And that's exactly what's happening. Rent prices are rocketing higher. Because we don't have enough homes. Here is uh, my question about the housing market. How does the government or BlackRock end up owning all the homes? Yes, they will use climate regulation, nonsense, taxes, and zoning to create more multiplex. Uh, but you will own nothing as a real plan. They will just inflate it to the point only organizations with access to free money can buy the property. Will they crash everything so hard that people are underwater and default? Then whoever owns the mortgage gets the property. Will they make it unaffordable? Or will they crash and tax, rezone, well, I'm not sure if that's what their plan is. I don't know their plan. But um, banks have loans against a lot of houses. And maybe it's like 50% or more. Uh, if we run into an energy constraint where the future, like let's say we hit peak oil and we hit some energy constraint. And I don't know if we have solutions for this type of energy constraint. But anyone who has a loan against a house, if you were to default against that loan, the bank would end up owning the house. So the, the banks would end up owning a lot of things if we were in that type of scenario. Problem is, I don't know if the people would just give it up in that type of scenario. I mean, the banks, in all honesty, they didn't put up any collateral for it. I mean, there's been people who've gone to the Supreme Court to fight that. Of course, they lost because if they, if they ruled in favor of the, of the banks in a fractional reserve lending system not putting up correct collateral, then everyone would get their house for free. So they couldn't this you guys, the system is it it's 
if you took it for like literal, if you were to literally go through and say, did the banks put up enough collateral against all the homes that are out there? The answer is no, that's fractional reserve lending. They have a fraction of the reserve held back. Technically, they didn't back it with something. Now, the dollar itself, if you were to look at how the Federal Reserve creates money, is just made up out of nothing. It comes from a blank checkbook or it comes from a blank account that just you can type in numbers and there it is. That's how they're creating all this money. It's not like it's backed by anything. Energy is what makes this thing go around, but it's not really backed by anything. So you could go and, and look at the entire system and say, this is garbage, this is garbage, this is garbage, and, and, and look at all these things in life and, and, and say that a lot of them are not legit. Legit being like, if you were to take some of these things to the T, you could blow holes through it. I mean, even if you were to take it to the Supreme Court, which is a court system, do you think that isn't corrupt? The whole system's corrupt. How do those people get in there? They have alliances. They have partnerships. They, they, they somehow align themselves with certain parties and, and certain things. And I mean, do you really get a, a, an honest reading going through that? Probably not. They all have their their alliances and their their parties that they they work with, and and who voted them in, and all these inter political interconnections. So I mean, to me, it's like I don't know. It's 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 all kind of garbage, it's, and and a lot of this stuff's all man made anyway. It's all made up by man. It's not like it's it's something that's constrained in the in the real world. I mean, that's, that's kind of my, my take on it. Um, and, and guys, any of these things that come up like WhatsApp and all that stuff, I don't have a WhatsApp, WhatsApp account. It's not me. Um, even if they pretend like it's me, it's not me. Um, looking at this and here's one. It says, I really hope that stocks take off soon. The sprinkling in thing is getting expensive. If there's another pullback, I know I will definitely be buying more. Once again, I greatly appreciate the time you take to do these videos. I look forward to watching your daily uranium update videos as well as your gold, silver, and oil videos each day. Um, yeah, I, so when things move, they they usually move like they move really fast up and then they consolidate for a little while. I'd say 25, 30% is the up move. The down move could be, you know, 60, 70% or something like that. So we're actually in consolidating mode most of the time. Sometimes consolidations can go upward, uh, an upward slant. Uh, if money's really flowing into it, but uh, right now, I mean the the here I'll pull I'll pull some something up here uh, to show you. Oh, it's probably not that one. Hold on, it's this right here, and I'll talk about it. And and all I did, uh, so this is. This is this is the uranium market. It's behind me, and we've got a we've got the deficit here. Twenty twenty one's this this guy here, and we come on and we're we're we've got this deficit that's going in front of us. This is another one global supply demand deficit um, right here. If you look at last bull market, it was this little deficit right here, and we've got this massive thing coming in front of us. So when I look at uranium. And I look at this massive deficit, and what this is, it's minus 100 million pounds out here. They got about the same for this chart as well. I look at that, and I'm like, we're going to go so far higher in the future. Why are we worrying about the short-term movements you know, today? We should be accumulating and holding for this big bull market that's right in front of us. And it's going to be massive because the response in uranium isn't going to come very soon. So it, it's going to take time. And all we have to do is sit in it and wait. The ratio, the uranium to gold ratio, is incredibly cheap as well. It's in the 40s. If gold moves higher, that ratio is going to remain the same even if uranium moves higher. That means that uranium is going to have to move at a faster rate than gold. Same with oil. I think, I think the majority of people have, what, what they have wrong is they think this bull market is going to be a lot a lot smaller and a lot less than what it, I think it's really going to be. I think prices are going to go far higher than what most people think in both oil and uranium. And, and I know I've read some comments. People think that, that oil 
is just going to go away. Like, like we, we're going to, we're going to make all these EV vehicles. We're going to put all these renewables in and, and it's just going to work. Here's the problem. Uh, I think that oil and, and fossil fuels is subsidizing all of the electric vehicles in energy returns. Energy returns is how much energy it takes to get something back. I don't think we have us. A, a, I don't think we've demonstrated that renewables can be self-sustaining without the fossil fuels. If that is the case, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that is the case. So let's assume that's the case that fossil fuels are subsidizing renewables. That you have to have fossil fuels, otherwise you wouldn't have the renewables because they're being subsidized by the energy returns. So if that is the case, and we put carbon credits on on fossil fuels. It means that we're going to drive the price of everything higher. Renewables are going to become less, less, they're going to become less affordable. Everything else in this world is going to become less affordable if you put carbon credits on fossil fuels because fossil fuels are subsidizing absolutely everything. So all you're doing is you're just raising the costs of everything upward. That's all you're doing. And if you look at, let's say, like a mine, and we put these carbon credits in, it means that the, the mines are all going to get more expensive. They're going to have carbon credits themselves, which then they're going to have to spend more money to get the carbon credits, which is, means it's, you're, you're just going to drive metal prices through the roof. The cost curves are all going to go up. So then they're going to say, well, you're going to have to invest in renewables. Well, renewables don't last forever. So what are we going to do? Go around the world putting in solar panels nonstop? It's something like we could be putting in, I think this is the, the number, and this was a while back. We have to install something on the lines of 250,000 solar panels on the rooftops of homes. And it's something like every week for the rest of our lives, and we still couldn't catch up to the energy needs that we want. And you have to also keep in mind that energy growth, it would limit our, our growth in economic growth. Because we would be, we're, we're basically constrained how fast we can grow energy. What is our GDP growth? That's how it's linked. So if we put a bunch of carbon credits on fossil fuels and we can't grow the energy as fast in renewables, well, then how the heck are you going to grow your, your economies? If you don't grow your economies, how are they going to grow their taxes? Through carbon credits? And I don't know much about carbon credits. I, I just think it's kind of like this one, a big scam. Uh, that's what I think. Maybe you can make a bunch of money in it. I don't know. But if fossil fuels are subsidizing all this stuff, all you're going to see is a massive increase in, in costs. If that's the case, holding physical metals is probably one of your best bets, and royalty companies would be very good as well. Those, I, everything goes back to those two in the, in the metal complex. Owning the fossil fuels, if you have carbon credits, and they're the ones subsidizing, if they're the driver of growth, if they are, then they have all the value. Everything else is just piggybacking off that value. So no matter how expensive it gets, we have to go and use that if that's the one that's subsidizing it. If. I mean, what are we going to do? Build a whole bunch of solar on all these rooftops and then 10, 20 years later have to redo all of it again and then 10, 20 years later redo it all of it again? And this stuff isn't... I don't think a lot of it's recyclable, really, and it's pretty toxic, so I don't see... The value there, I, I don't. It doesn't make sense to me. And I'm not saying that. I mean, we, we have to have better solutions. I mean, having a car that's four thousand, five thousand pounds in size, carrying a load of two, three, four, five hundred pounds seems pretty wasteful to me. There's got to be a way to get that ratio that's better, uh, where you're carrying more weight than than moving the weight of the vehicle. All the energy is moving the weight of the vehicle, not necessarily the the, the load of it. So we need lighter solutions. We need that, that ratio of, of what it's carrying to the weight of the vehicle to be changed a little bit. In my opinion, I think there's a, a lot of improvement there. Uh, so that's, that's what I have in this clip. Hopefully you guys give me a thumbs up. Hopefully you guys like it. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And thank you for listening. This is Finding Value.